Okay, welcome everybody. This is Grandmaster Alexander Lenderman with the second part of this video series, different pawn structures. And uh, today I'm going to show you also how to play with an isolated pawn. When sometimes you have an isolated pawn, pawn on d4 in particular, but you might not necessarily be able to attack on the king's side, like we saw in the previous example, or we don't have a chance to break d5, like in the previous example. So therefore, we have to switch to another plan, and that plan, as you'll see, is to attack on the queen's side. And um, let me show you a game between Karpov and Short to demonstrate the point. So d4, d5. C4, D takes C4. That's called the Queen's Gambit accepted. Knight F3, A6. So the purpose of the move A6 is to prepare B5 and try to hold on to this pawn. E3, Knight F6. And of course, if he goes B5, White will play A4. Bishop B7 takes, takes. Rook takes A8, Bishop takes A8, B3, and try to chip away on this pawn right here. So, black goes here, takes e6, castles and plays c5 to try to challenge center. And the white can of course take this pawn, that's one line and there are many other things he can do, but he goes bishop d3, moving the bishop away from this tempo b5. And now black takes, so if he were to go b5, White can maybe play a4 with a temple, put pressure on this guy. So takes, takes, bishop e7, and so we get a position with the isolated pawn right here. b5, a4, b4, knight e4, bishop e7. And here in this example, it's clear that black's getting developed pretty quickly. So, because of that, it's going to be much harder to attack on the king's side, because black's pieces are really well coordinated. But the one thing slightly wrong with black's position is that he played b5 and then b4. Which means that there are some weaknesses now, in particular the c4 square, the c5 square. Why are these squares weak? Because the pawn on b7 can't put pressure on these squares anymore. So therefore, white will try to play on the queen side using the fact that he has some outposts on the queen side. Queen e2, castles rook d1, knight d7, and now white played a really interesting move, knight e to d2. Once again, when you look at a position like that, you have to first thing you have to ask yourself. Can d5 possibly work? But of course, in a position like this, it will never work because there are just too many pieces on that square and it really leads to nothing. Normally, in order for d5 to work, you need the knight on c3. And here, the knight's not on c3. So, there's really nothing much going on. Also, it's very hard to actually make a rook click or queen lift or anything like that, like we saw in the previous example. So, there's no way to attack. So therefore, Karpov chooses another plan to try to play for an advantage. She goes knight e to d2. And also, why this move is good is because it prevents the trades. So let's say if white made a random developing move, then black can do this, trade a couple of times, and the more trades black gets, the better it is for him, because black eventually wants to free himself up and start putting pressure on this weak isolated pawn. And uh, black wants to just get rid of the pressure. So that's black's plan. So this knight ed2 move is a really nice move, which has two purposes. a5. Otherwise, white will possibly play a5 and fixate this weakness as well. So black played a5. But now white goes bishop b5. A very nice square for the bishop, an outpost. Knight b6. And now that the c4 square is controlled, white goes now knight b3, because now the c5 square isn't controlled. So as you can see, it's very hard to control 
both these squares. Bishop d5, knight c5, knight d7, bishop e3. And already white's getting a very nice position. His pieces are really nicely coordinated and he has developed very nice harmony. And uh, white's pieces are just more active than black's. Black is seriously under pressure. Rook a7, knight e5. Once again, taking either knight would be bad because the pawn will capture back and uh, there is going to be either a pass pawn on c5 or a pawn on e5 which will attack the knight, again leading to some problems with the coordination. Knight b8, bishop f4, just again slightly improving the situation. Knight e8, and then finally once white put his minor pieces all in ideal squares, he starts improving his heavy pieces. Rook d3. Not only is that making a rook lift, but also trying to activate this lazy piece, this other rook. It's very important in chess to have all of their pieces playing together. You have to have all of your pieces doing something. It's like you're a general of a big army and you have to have all of your army doing something. Black tries to trade off pieces, finally, to relieve some pressure. At this point, bishop g3 makes little sense because first of all, it takes away a square from the rook. Second of all, it activates this bishop and now white can't play ever rook c1. And the bishop is not super active on g3 anymore. So in this case, it's okay to allow the trade because not trading would be worse. Queen takes, rook g3, queen e7, queen h5. And now white wants to induce more weaknesses. And eventually black played a5. Maybe that move was not so necessary, but I guess he realized that if he never plays it, he's just going to be under serious pressure. Rook h3, knight f6, queen h4, g6, and now rook back to e3. So the rook did its job, inducing a weakness, and now white shifts his gear to pressuring on e6. Rook d8, and now another important move, f3, taking away squares from this bishop, and in general, making this bishop biting on granite. Rook c7, rook a1, knight h5, and now he trades queens. Because the queen was black's one of the better defenders, and white queen wasn't really all that special anymore, and white wants to now put pressure on the weak e6 pawn. So you see this pressure he had, he induced a weakness because of that. King f2, knight g7, and now g4, restricting this knight. Rook c7, rook c1, g5, rook back to e1. Just slowly but surely consolidating. As you see, Karpov is playing really patiently. He's trying to improve his position to the maximum. h5, h3, no rush, no reason to give any sign of counterplay. Karpov was really, really good at that. Takes, f takes, rook check, king e3, rook f4, and now he traded this active rook. Knight c6, takes, takes, rook f6. And again, black's left with this weakness and this bad knight. And uh, so not a lot of counterplay, and eventually this weakness will fall. Takes, takes, bishop d5, rook g6, rook c8, trying to desperately create counterplay with the rook. Takes rook f8. But now this knight finally did all its job on c5, and now it returns to base and uh, actually puts pressure on the king's side where it can do some even more damage. King h7, knight f4, bishop b3. Knight d7, rook f7, knight c5, bishop d1, knight e4, rook f8, knight f2, bishop's running out of squares, well also defends the g4 pawn which will be really important. Takes, rook takes a5, bishop c6, rook a7, and uh, black resigned. Because not only is he down a pawn, but he's probably gonna lose this pawn at some point, and then white will play knight d3, knight e5, g5 and blacks down a pawn with a passive position and no real prospects of defending. 
so that's why he resigned. So this was a nice game by Karpov. Now I'm gonna show you another game by Karpov. It was played in a similar way. So we got a Nimzo Indian, Queen C2, castles A3, takes takes B6, Bishop G5, Bishop B7, E3, D6, F3, Knight G7, Bishop D3, C5, Knight E2, Rook C8, Queen D2, getting away from pressure on the C file, and finally we will get an isolated pawn position. And once again, one pair of minor pieces already got traded, so clearly there's not going to be much prospects for an attack. No d5 ideas, d5 square is really anchored, no real attacking chances, not with f3 played, it just doesn't seem like there are attacking chances. Not enough pieces to attack and the king is really seemingly safe and no rook lifts, not, nothing like that. So once again, he's playing positionally. He's using the fact that maybe this knight is not so great and he's using the fact that he has two bishops and he's playing positionally. So first these bishops make black's rook passive. Now bishop back to g5, creating once again a very annoying pin. Knight back, castles. That was also to not maybe discourage knight to c6, not letting black develop knight in a comfortable way. And now the knight gets into the game. Now pressure on the spawn. And now black that induced the weakness and now there we go the knight's coming to c5 just like we saw in the previous example. Once the pawn pushes to b5 this square very often we go for that square the c5 square. Queen b6 knight c5 and now of course this would be bad because takes takes bishop f2 losing the exchange probably more because this will be pinned. So rook e8, b4, and now the square is anchored, and once again white has full control over the whole board, and black has no activity. And slowly but surely, similar to the last game, black gets suffocated. Bishop here, queen d2, knight d5, bishop e4, and basically the rest of the game wasn't perfect, so I'll go through it quickly, but as you'll see, white just step by step put all this pressure and eventually won the very nice game. So knight f6. Rook e1, knight h7, bishop f2, knight f8, bishop b1, queen a7, knight e4, so threatening knight d6, queen e7, bishop g3, rook d8, and again just a lot of slow maneuvers, and eventually white breaks through. Slowly, slowly but surely. Just taking away counterplay little by little until finally black cracks. And in fact, as far as I know, black lost this game on time. Well, who can blame him? You know, 58 moves, 58 torturous moves to play in this position without any counterplay. And now I wanted to show you actually one of my games, which I played against the strong grandmaster Sergey Ehrenberg very recently. And I'm gonna jump through the opening and uh, I'm gonna quickly get to a certain position. And here we get a critical line and uh, basically right here the critical move is e5 to try to basically create counterplay. But that involves a pawn sack and that's a very sharp line. But my opponent played a6. And now you'll see how I use the similar idea to create a really dominant position. So rook c1, bishop d7, knight c5, bishop e8, rook c2, bishop f6, knight e4, that's to discourage knight c7. So he went back, rook c1, I can always go back to c5, g6, and now h4, takes, takes. And now in this structure, once again, I have a good attacking prospect. Maybe he did not have to go g6, but he was afraid of potential pressure here. 
h5. And now here takes takes and here I missed a nice opportunity to get a big advantage. Another opportunity involved the move just straightforward g4. And the reason I did not play it is because I was afraid of e5. And after, well, I thought d takes e5, bishop d7 is just a lot of counterplay. And indeed, that turned out to be true. But I failed to realize that this pawn on e5 looks strong, but I don't actually have to take it. As a matter of fact, I can just simply set up a huge mating attack, which simply cannot be stopped. So I'm going to give you guys some time to see if you can find it. So you can pause your videos now. Try to see if you can find the winning plan for white. So if you need more time, keep your videos paused. The move is queen h2 exclamation mark. With a simple straightforward idea of just going queen h3 and rook h2. And queen h8 mate. That's it. And surprisingly, black actually has simply no adequate way to dealing with this. I just missed that. But it goes to show you that when all of black's pieces, as you see, are all on the queen side, and the king side is left open, there's a good chance that an attack can come out of nowhere. And that's exactly what was going to happen. You know, no matter what black does, he's just simply not fast enough. There's just simply no defense to the mate. h8 square. I missed that, unfortunately. And as a matter of fact, the black's best move would be to take and somehow desperately sack a piece to try to trade off the knight. And then maybe go bishop f6. But of course it's down a piece and it's lost. Instead, I played knight c5, back, bishop f6, and now after bishop e4 he got defensive chances with knight e7. And later on I won this game when he got into time pressure in the time scramble. So those are the three games which I thought were really interesting. And they showed a way to attack or to put pressure on the opponent when you have an isolated pawn. Sometimes even when there is no straightforward attack using the key c5 square, putting pressure on the queen side. So I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. And in the next video, we're going to be seeing examples of how to play against the isolated pawn. So see you guys next video. Bye-bye.